Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Now, I need more William Lane Craig in my life, like I need a sulfuric acid high colonic. But the fact is that he is one of the most highly regarded Christian scholars in the realm of apologetics. He shared the stage and debated with the likes of Christopher Hitchens, Lawrence Krauss, and Sam Harris, among several others. He's written a number of books on the subject of Christianity and faith. And interestingly, even though it could never be considered a feather in one's cap, he went to the same high school in East Peoria, Illinois as Kent Hovind, and they both attended that school at the same time. Now, that little factoid isn't of any real importance. I just found it very interesting that one of the most famous and one of the most infamous Christian apologists were schoolmates. Now, while I've already addressed part of Craig's interview with conservative commentator Ben Shapiro in the past, I did so purely to respond to and debunk Craig's Kalam cosmological argument. But he and Shapiro talked at length on other faith-related matters. And he spends some time addressing atheist claims and criticisms of faith. So rather than consider Craig a one-trick pony with nothing to offer except the Kalam, I wanted to address some of his other points where atheism is concerned. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So get the ball rolling for us, Craig. Let's talk about a couple of those philosophy arguments from 101 that are constantly trotted out. I've had similar experiences. The most common one that I've heard, of course, is the problem of evil. In dealing with this problem, I think it's really important that we distinguish between what I call the intellectual problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. There is no doubt that emotionally, the evil and suffering in the world make it very difficult to believe in God. It's a tremendous emotional obstacle. So the problem of evil is one of the main criticisms atheists have of belief in a supposedly all-powerful, all-loving God. And it's a multifaceted criticism. There are several layers to the problem of evil. And I have rarely, if ever, seen any apologist address them all. Usually they'll just address one aspect of it and consider the problem of evil thoroughly debunked. For instance, an apologist may say, hey, people do evil to each other because God gave them free will, and God can't interfere with what humans choose to do with that free will. Boom, problem of evil dealt with in its entirety. But that fails to address the problem of terrible things absent of human involvement, like natural disasters or terminal illnesses. Now, while Shapiro and Craig are addressing those sorts of things here, that also is not the only layer of the problem of evil. They're focusing on it from a human-centric standpoint. They're only thinking about tragedies or suffering that occurs to humans. But of course, we aren't the only beings on this planet capable of suffering. Even if you can come up with some kind of rationalization for why bad things may happen to humans, God's supposed favorite creatures, and really the only thing he truly cares about, you haven't rationalized why, in the wild, totally absent of human involvement, horrible things happen to so many of the other living things on this planet. I mean, why did God create parasitic fungus that takes over ants' brains and controls their actions to the ants' literal death? Why are there parasites that rarely, if ever, affect humans, but infest animals, causing them immense suffering and pain and possibly death? Most all of this happens out in the wild, absent of human involvement or even human witness. What's the point of any of this? It can't be in any way for our benefit or our betterment as humans, as it happens mostly outside of our knowledge. So, why? So God can sit back and watch helpless creatures suffer needlessly? Some all-good God? But intellectually, considered dispassionately, as a philosophical problem, it's extraordinarily difficult to show that there's either any inconsistency or improbability between the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful God and the evil and suffering in the world. The atheist would have to show that it is either impossible or improbable 
that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the natural and moral evil in the world. And how could he possibly show that? We're simply not in a position to make those kind of probability judgments with any confidence. I disagree. It seems to me rather easy to establish that, especially when we're talking about a God of absolutes. Omnibenevolent, that means all good, totally good, always 100% of the time wanting the best, kindest, and most benevolent outcomes for humans. Omnipotent, that means all-powerful, totally capable of achieving and manifesting anything he wants at any time. Omniscient, that means all-knowing, totally cognizant of everything that happens, can happen, and will happen. Perfect knowledge of exactly what the outcome of any action will ever be and how to make his preferred outcome happen exactly as he wants it. This all means that if God wanted no life form on this planet to ever suffer, he has the power to make that happen and the knowledge of how to make it happen. And the power and knowledge to make that happen with no unintended negative consequences. You could try to throw out the old adage that we fall so we can learn to pick ourselves up, the idea that we're besieged with suffering and hardship so that we can become stronger and learn to overcome it, but even that is illogical in the face of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. He would have the power to make the world and make all life on it in such a way as to not require hardship to overcome in order to better us. He could pull the proverbial snap of his fingers and everything is perfect. No hardship or suffering is present in the world, nor required for any reason. If God exists and has the power and knowledge to make the world an evil-free utopia and doesn't do it, then he must not want to, and thus is not all-loving. If he has the desire and the knowledge of how to make the world an evil-free utopia and doesn't do it, then he must not have the power, and thus is not all-powerful. And if he has the power and the desire to make the world an evil-free utopia and doesn't do it, then he must not know how to adequately achieve it, and thus is not all-knowing. There is simply no way to rationalize an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God creating a universe of suffering and evil unless he was absent of one of these three traits. Or, of course, he doesn't exist at all. And these days, the, the other argument that is brought up an enormous amount is the supposed backwardness of the Bible itself and biblical morality. This happens largely mm -hmm. with regard to, for example, homosexual marriage. Uh, it's been brought up uh, with regard to abortion, which I think is more, again, easily disposable because I think there's a solid secular yeah. argument in favor of, of the protection of human life. But homosexual marriage is the one that, that most often comes up. You also hear arguments that the Bible permits slavery. Uh, so if the Bible is so wonderful, then why are there all these weird sections of the Bible where it talks about wiping peoples from the earth? Well, let me address briefly first this question of slavery. When we hear the word slavery, Ben, we think of slavery as it existed in the American South. I can already tell where he's going with this, and it's a despicable attempt at a rationalization. He's going to try to establish that slavery in the Bible was merely indentured servitude, and it was a voluntary arrangement, and the slaves chose their position. They were let free after so long, blah, blah, blah. Heard it all a hundred times before, and it has all been debunked a hundred and one times before. It is an incredibly weak attempt to explain it away, and it's a really bad look for Christians. It's also all apologists have to try to explain it away. Frankly, they'd be better off just admitting that the Bible has some bad stuff in it, but that that doesn't mean we should ignore the good stuff, i.e. don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But instead, they always opt for this idea of defending every single word of the Bible regardless of how terrible it is. And this is one aspect where it's very terrible. And as you know, that is nothing like the system that existed in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, there was no social safety net 
sponsored by the state. There was no poverty program. So if a man got himself into a situation where he couldn't pay his debts, he could keep his family together and retain his self-respect by selling himself as an indentured servant to his creditor until he could work off his debts and then he would have to be set free. After seven years, he had to be set free in any case. And as to whether or not it was a position available for paying off debt is no great excuse for the practice. I mean, people get in debt to other people today and slavery to the debt holder is not a viable means of repayment. Even if both parties are agreeable to it, it isn't legal. Why? I don't know. Guess people these days seem to have a bit of an aversion to a relationship between parties where one is allowed to beat the other severely so long as they don't die within a day or two. So this was really a form of indentured servanthood. It wasn't slavery as we think of that term. This was actually an anti-poverty program. And in some respects, I think it's better than what we have in modern Western culture. See what I mean about this being a bad look for Christians? I mean, how do they say things like this and not hear how terrible it sounds? Slavery, indentured servitude, compelled worker, voluntary laborer, whatever you want to call it. And it was just an anti-poverty program? Seriously? There were very similar attempts to excuse early American slavery as well. Claims that it was keeping the black population out of the poverty that they surely would fall into if they should be freed. And the African slaves that were captured and enslaved, well, that was just civilizing the poor unfortunate savages. Not so different from the Hebrews civilizing the slaves they took from the heathens around them. The slavery of the Bible was not nearly as benevolent and a simple financial arrangement as Craig and others who attempt to justify it try to claim it as. And the attempts to rationalize it as such are just gross. I mean, the proof is right there in the wording. Craig, you said... After seven years, he had to be set free in any case. I mean, did you think we wouldn't check the Bible on that? What, do you think we atheists will burn at the touch of a Bible so we're just going to take your word for it rather than cracking it open? And I mean, you are a Christian scholar. There's simply no way you don't know that the Bible gives ways of enslaving people for the rest of their lives. But you're here saying that, in any case, they had to be set free after seven years. But you know that's not true. I don't say this often because one should never attribute to malice what can be better attributed to stupidity. But Craig, I'm just going to say it. You're a liar. Now, the first thing you mentioned, I've, I've forgotten. Homosexual oh. marriage. Yeah, same-sex okay. marriage. With respect to some of these other moral questions, I think we need to remember the first premise of the moral argument. If there is no God, then there are no objective moral values and duties. Everything is socioculturally relative. So who's to say that the moral values of a society that discriminates uh, against people and oppresses people is worse than one which is liberal and tolerant? We just sort of assume that the, the liberal values um, are the ones that would be objective, when in fact they're just as relativistic as any of the other ones on atheism. So now he's trying to assert that without God, without an objective moral law giver, nothing is wrong. Oppression of minority groups is not wrong at all if it's not objectively wrong. Inequality is not wrong at all if it's not objectively wrong, etc. This is such narrow thinking. Just because things are not objectively wrong does not mean that they cannot be wrong at all. Subjective morality is a thing, and common subjective morality is a thing. 
I mean, Craig, would it be objectively wrong for me to say to you, Why don't you go outside and play hide and go fuck yourself? No, certainly not. The dreaded F word is not objectively immoral. Nor is any combination of words objectively immoral. With the caveat that I will include for the sake of Christians, so long as we refrain from taking the Lord's name in vain. But I mean, we invent language, and our usage of it is entirely contextual. Swearing at a person is only considered wrong because we have commonly agreed to it being considered wrong. This is subjective morality at work. This is why we don't drop F-bombs in children's programming. This is why we don't flip our grandmother the bird across the dinner table. This is why when ball players smack each other's asses after a good play, they aren't brought up on sexual harassment charges, but managers in an office who do the same thing are. We've developed common contextual subjective morality on a whole host of things, and I defy any apologist to deny that fact. So it's a relatively minor extension of that premise to expand that to, well, every moral question. This is why ethics are a better and more accurate form of standards than morals, because while both deal with right and wrong, ethics are generally understood to be standards set by a community or society. So ethics would be understood to be subjective assessments of right and wrong brought about by common subjective ideas about preferable social behavior. This also explains why different communities and societies have such massive differences and ideas about what right and wrong is. Now, it can easily be seen why people with a theistic mindset don't like this idea of subjective morality being all that there really is, because they prefer an easy black and white layout of right and wrong. This idea of ethics that are culturally contextual and subjective morality just puts everything into varying shades of gray. But the universe does not owe you simplicity. And just because there is no clear differentiation between right and wrong handed down to us from on high doesn't mean that right and wrong are non-existent. They're just more complicated than you would like. And to that, I say tough. Get over it. If God were to say, thou shalt not eat beans, uh, or thou shalt not eat pork, that would be our moral duty, and we should obey it. That is his prerogative as the moral lawgiver and the supreme good. And so if God says, my plan for human sexuality is heterosexual marriage, that's his prerogative. And there is no basis for calling that, I think, into question. The only basis for asserting that such a proclamation is God's prerogative is the idea that he created it so he gets to set the rules. And I don't see why that would be the case. If God exists, which, as an aside, by the way, you haven't established that he has, so I guess we're just assuming his existence for the sake of all of these arguments, but even if he does exist, why does he get to set the rules of right and wrong? I mean, why does creating a thing automatically entail dominion over the rules that that thing must abide by? A parent creates their child. Do they get to tell them exactly what they have to do forever and ever? What reason do we have to assume that if God exists, he created the very nature of right and wrong and has any control at all over such things? You think I'm God? But of course. You look down on us from heaven. Uh, God? Hi, Bill Watson. I, uh, live in the clock building. I have a question. If you're so good, why do you allow bad things to happen? Boy, am I so fat. Yeah. Why do bad things happen to good people? And as for what God's plan for human sexuality or any other plan that he might have are, why should we give a shit? Unless it's just a might-makes-right argument, and if we don't do what he says, he'll send us to hell which is the primary fallback position of most Christians when the supposed proclamations of God are called into question. But that's just excusing the bad behavior of a cosmic bully who nobody can stop from bullying us. So, you never even came close to establishing that any sort of objective cosmic morality actually exists, 
let alone that any god exists who imposed it. You're just asserting that such objective morality exists because you don't like the idea that there isn't one. But that isn't proof. That's just an assertion. And one that I reject completely. So I see no reason to affirm objective morality, ergo no reason to affirm any kind of moral law giver. And even if there were one, there's no reason to assert that what he thinks about morality should override what we think about morality just because he's more powerful than us and has a plan. I mean, frankly, screw his plan. I mean, the Christian conception is that God gave humanity free will to choose our own plan and our own path. The consequence of that is that he doesn't get to tell us what to do. He doesn't get to force his plan on us. And he doesn't get to force his morality on us either. At this point, all he's got is, do what I say or it's hell for you. Which just makes him the biggest prick ever. Here, do what you want, but you better do what I say. Doesn't seem quite so just or loving, does it? Well, maybe he doesn't exist at all. So how exactly do we determine when we have moved beyond the biblical text in terms of the evolution of that morality? When are we fulfilling uh, a broader goal that was that you know was kind of held back by temporary constraints? And when are we moving utterly beyond it? And again, here I'm thinking of same-sex marriage. So mm -hmm. when it comes to same-sex marriage, the argument is now being made by people in liberal churches. That basically, Jesus w was seeking equal respect for everyone. He cared about the least of these. And the prescriptions on homosexuality were really more, and homosexual activity were not eternal precepts, but were really attempting to crack down on the, yeah. the promiscuity of the time, oh. or they were temporary expedients. Yeah, I, I think that's clearly false. When you look at these uh, regulations, both in the Old Testament and then they're repeated in the New Testament in the strongest terms in Romans chapter 1, um, there's no doubt that Paul is thinking of this as a moral law that has abiding significance. And it's gr grounded again, I think, in the creation story that God has created human sexuality is created man and woman uh, in such a way that the fulfillment of that relationship will take place within the safety and security of a heterosexual marriage. Now, maybe they've strayed away from the idea of what they were supposed to be focused on, which was debunking atheists' arguments. Because the only way any of this section matters at all is if you believe in or care what it says in the Bible. I don't care what the Bible says about gay marriage or homosexuality, nor do atheists in general. You haven't established the veracity of the Bible anywhere in this interview. In fact, I've already shown you misuse the Bible and your faulty biblical claims where slavery was concerned. If your argument against homosexuality is that it's prohibited in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, well, I don't give a damn. And I don't see any reason why I or anyone else should. Honestly, the only way any of these arguments work is by presupposing God's existence as true and then following from there. Because God exists, he gave us the Bible and so we must follow it. Because God exists, he said homosexuality is wrong and we must follow that. Because God exists, slavery is okay and we must follow that. Well, you've never established that God exists, you've just asserted it and assumed it as a starting point from which all the rest of your arguments flow. Here's the problem of evil. Well, if God exists, then he can do whatever he likes, so the problem of evil is solved. Here's the problem of immorality in the Bible. Well, if God exists, then he can set morality however he likes, so there's no immorality in the Bible. Well, how about this, Craig? If God doesn't exist, then evil, or more aptly put, the suffering and hardship that exists are natural outgrowths of an indifferent, conscienceless universe. And if God doesn't exist, there's no objective morality, just common ethical conceptions that we apply across cultures and societies. And if God doesn't exist, then the Bible is total BS. 
So in a godless universe, all of this stuff makes perfect sense. But even in your assumed God-created universe, it doesn't. Because your rationalization of the problem of evil is insufficient in the face of a supposed triomni god. Your insistence on the existence of an objective morality is unsubstantiated in the face of vastly different moral conceptions from culture to culture or individual to individual. And your asserting of the Bible as the foundation of an inerrant moral framework is dubious in the face of its contradictory nature. All your arguments are a house of cards built on the unproven starting point that God exists, but even with that starting point, it fails. And without that starting point, you've got nothing at all. Without accepting God's existence from the beginning, your house of cards comes tumbling down. So that was William Lane Craig attempting to debunk common atheist arguments. Like most of Craig's interviews and debates, he tries to overload the conversation with enough verbiage that he ends up sidestepping the major issues, or just engages in enough hyperbole to make it seem like he's making salient points, when in fact he's just belaboring the point that Magic Man did Magic Thing. Or he's God so he can do whatever he wants. Neither of which is going to cut it as a refutation of atheism. And so that's where we're going to close things off for today. So thanks for everyone for watching. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.